Hi, I'm Forrest Hansen. I'm the son of Dr. Rick Hansen, the creator of the Foundations Program, and the author of the books Buddha's Brain and Hardwiring Happiness. So Dad, one of the things that I think people have a lot of questions about is how do you implement these practices in your daily life? You're just moving through the world, you're mm -hmm. having your own individual experiences, mm -hmm. and you're trying to implement the things you talk about to other people. Yeah. So how do you go about doing that? Hmm. It's, it's a good question. It puts me on the spot in a good way. Um, when I reflect on it, I do think that I have benefited from these practices myself, mm -hmm. including developing more of a habit of just scanning for good facts in everyday life. Not overlooking bad facts, but actually just being more aware of and more uh, sensitive to the good facts of everyday life. And then when I see them, second, I, I tend to, much more as a habit, feel something, mm -hmm. honestly. Like, right there are your beautiful eyes. I was feeling something. Uh, and then third, most important, I try to be kind of spongy so it sinks in. Mm -hmm. So that's been a general shift. It's literally become a habit for me to kind of lean into the good and show up for it and be receptive to it. The second thing that's really changed for me is I um, usually have something that I'm growing these days, some particular mental muscle, some inner strength of one kind or another that I'm cultivating, or it even could be a kind of stabilization of an experience that's become important. Like for example, feeling safer around other people. Uh, we all tend to be a little nervous around other people. My own temperament's a little anxious. So to be able to realize that many people are actually not threatening, and I can afford to be more undefended, more present, and enjoy uh, the peacefulness of not needing to be anxious when I'm around another person. So that's just an example of growing a particular uh, inner strength these days. Oh, that's great. So your work has covered a lot of different topics as you've moved through it. Mm -hmm. It's covered a lot of different areas. There's a lot of material there. I certainly know that from personal experience. Yeah. And if you could recommend just one thing to people, maybe mm. one simple practice that they could do on a daily basis mm. in a complicated and increasingly time-demanding life, mm -hmm. what would that one thing be? Mm. Well, I think, first of all, it would be the habit mm -hmm. of taking in the good. So I'm kind of doing a trick here with my one wish. I'm wishing for infinite wishes sure. because as soon as you start developing the habit of taking the good as you move through your day, mm -hmm. your whole life changes. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the day, instead of being a problem or a long, slow slog, feels like a path strewn with hundreds of little tiny jewels mm -hmm. that you can actually uh, take into yourself, at least a handful of them, every day. So that's one thing big thing for sure. But if I were to pick something else mm -hmm. that I've really seen for people makes a big difference for them from the inside out, is to look for those opportunities to feel truly cared about mm -hmm. by other beings. And feeling cared about for me is on a range. It includes five major components. Um, start with feeling included, mm -hmm. a sense of belonging, one that's legitimately available, or a sense of being seen, or at least someone's trying to understand you. Like I can watch you trying to understand me and what I'm saying here. Or third, feeling appreciated, feeling respected, feeling that you've actually contributed to others. Or feeling liked, just ordinary friendliness with the guys in the deli. They're not your best friends, but it's real. That is a chance to feel liked. Or fifth, actually feeling loved. And uh, it may seem uh, somehow not utterly self-reliant, to open to feeling cared about. But I think for most people, that's where their deepest wounding is and their greatest longings, mm -hmm. to feel more cared about by others. And also because we're the most socially, um, we're the most social species on mm -hmm. the planet, it's actually uh, self-reliant to open to and reach for and take into yourself experiences of being really supported and cared about by others. Because then as you do that, you become more and more able to be independent and strong yourself, mm -hmm. and thus fundamentally more self-reliant. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think that there's a very natural transition there, mm -hmm. because you're talking about us being a very social species, right. and we really, you know, take in positives mm -hmm. and feel good about ourselves through yeah. engaging with other people, and how, I know for a lot of people, and myself included, mm -hmm. really just the best experience in the world is feeling like somebody really likes you. Yeah. Or feeling like you did something mm -hmm. that, you know, really spoke to somebody else in yeah. some deep way. Mm -hmm. That's a deeply rewarding feeling. Mm. And I know that you've spent mm. 20, 30, 40 years mm -hmm. really, really looking at relationships initially as, you know, 
family counseling mm-hmm. and working with a lot of couples mm-hmm. and working with a lot of kids. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering, so in that period of time, have you really run into a couple of core things, mm-hmm. you know, really critical components about relationships where if they're there, things work, mm-hmm. but if they're not there, things just kind mm-hmm. of don't work the same mm-hmm. way. That's great. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Um, it's like we're related. Well, two things. One is I see it again and again and again, the ways in which two people are related mm-hmm. and when you know one person does something, <coughs> the other person is stuck to it. They're kind okay, of yeah. coupled in a negative sense of the word, like through a metal mm-hmm. bar. So if you get angry, I got to react this way. If you mm-hmm. get sad, I got to react that way, right? And to establish a fundamental stance in which you're really receptively present with another person Mm -hmm. while feeling fundamentally free inside yourself in terms of your responses to that other person, that creates the kind of autonomy over here that's the necessary condition for intimacy over there. Mm -hmm. And that capacity to be really receptively present while retaining your own individuality, your own autonomy, your own independence, your own dignity, uh, your own freedom inside, to not be so implicated in the mind stream of another person, Mm -hmm. I think that's a necessary condition for a relationship that has any real depth to it. And then the second thing that I've seen a lot is we feel so unnecessarily threatened by other people. Mm -hmm. Quite routinely, we tend to feel you know, that another person is attacking us or is against us or is doing something that threatens our core interests, when really they're not. Maybe they're momentarily aggravating, but deep down inside, you fundamentally do not need to feel so threatened by that other person. Mm -hmm. So I actually do a lot of practices around realizing, oh, I actually don't need to be threatened Mm -hmm. by you. So those two things, I think, have made a big difference for me, and I've seen them make a big difference for other people. That's great. So a lot of kids say, I want to be a policeman when I grow up. You know, I want to be a fireman, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a superhero, you know, whatever it might be. Not a lot of kids go, I want to be a therapist when I grow up. That's that's something I haven't personally really heard ever. Um, So I'm just wondering, what was kind of your personal path to Mm -hmm. landing where you are now? Mm -hmm. How did you start this concept of taking in the good? How Mm -hmm. did you get into the idea of personal growth and really making it one of the core tenets of your own life? It may sound a little weird for me to say this, but I have a lot of memories of my early childhood. Mm -hmm. I mean, going back maybe barely three, could be even two years old. Mm -hmm. And in almost all of the memories of my early childhood, through middle childhood, you know, grade school and moving into junior high, one of the strong elements present in those memories again and again and again was this intuitive knowing in me as a kid that people were a lot more unhappier than they really needed to be. Mm -hmm. They were more frazzled, they were more irritated, they were more quarrelsome with each other than they really needed to be. Now, in the mind of a three-year-old in preschool or watching Mm -hmm. his mom be upset, it wasn't like some elaborated verbal philosophy, Mm -hmm. but really authentically present in my knowing of my experience as a young child was that sense of lots and lots of needless suffering, Mm -hmm. lots and lots of unnecessary Uh, unhappiness and lots and lots of ways in which opportunities for deep happiness were just kind of sucked out of the air. So very early on, I got interested in what's this about? Mm -hmm. It seems kind of crazy. We want to be happy and yet we keep constructing unhappiness Mm -hmm. inside our own minds or in our relationships with other people. And that set me on a path to try to gradually understand, you know, what are the causes of this unhappiness and what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. And I searched in various quarters, including the idea of becoming an astronaut Mm -hmm. or an astronomer or a geologist. But eventually I began stumbling upon the skills in psychology, which is about the mind or the kind of primary near at hand, experience near, causes of an unhappiness and happiness reside. And that then set me on my path by the time I was probably 17 years old. Sure. I got deeply interested in human potential and, and then clinical psychology, spiritual practice along the way, and then uh, neuropsychology most mm-hmm. recently. And so when I look back, uh, it all made sense. Mm-hmm. When I looked forward sure. from the perspective of a three-year-old or a 13-year-old, it was crazy chaos. Mm-hmm. But on the whole, um, to me, the neatest, most cool, and intellectually interesting, and even important thing to do 
is to help people learn how to self-create their own happiness from the inside out, mm -hmm. no matter their circumstances. Uh, here's, though, a really important point. This doesn't mean not helping the world have fresh water or protecting the rights sure. of children and women, um, you know, social justice and so forth. It's not either or, so many people frame it. Um, on the other hand, from my point of view, the world is really slow to change. But the opportunity to change yourself rapidly from the inside out, right between your own ears, mm -hmm. is available to us every minute of every day. Mm -hmm. uh, only we can use that power. It's totally on us to use that power. I'm really old school. You got to do the work. You got to be for yourself from the inside out. No one else will be inside you, for you. You have to do it for yourself. But if you do do it for yourself, you can have confidence that what you're doing, including the practices and the Foundations of Wellbeing program, that these practices will bear fruit for you over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. So we talk a lot about um, <coughs> solutions to the problems. You talk about developing inner strengths in the mm -hmm. Foundations program, the concept of taking in the good as a whole, mm -hmm. these various like processes for yeah. really um, building sources of strength inside of your own self mm -hmm. and then applying them to problems out in the world. Mm. So my question around that is just as we look at the strengths, mm. sometimes it's important to look at the things that cause us to be unhappy in the first place, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So what are maybe three core stumbling blocks or trigger points mm. or other things that you just see seem to cause a lot of unnecessary stress or mm. pain mm -hmm. or worry or consternation, whatever mm. you want to say, mm -hmm. for people as they kind of move through life? And how do you address those in your own life? Yeah, great. Well, you're, you're at it. Um, the first one, I think, and this was a huge lesson for me, because okay. I landed in adulthood numb from the neck down. Okay. In other words, I had to wake down, not just mm -hmm. wake up, as sure. it were. And it was critically important for me, and I think for people in general, to feel your feelings, mm -hmm. experience your experience. And when you are bothered by something or frazzled by something or irritated by something, let yourself have that experience. Hold it in a space of mindful awareness. Try to step back from the movie so you're witnessing it rather than glued to the screen. But if we don't feel our feelings and let them flow through us, we end up being full of what we don't let flow. Sure. Uh, the mind-brain system is not like a flush toilet. It's more like a septic tank, and what you put in there sticks mm -hmm. around. So sure. one of the great lessons, I think, for people is counterintuitive, uh, counterintuitive and paradoxical. If you want to feel less pain, let the pain flow through you. Mm -hmm. That's the first deep teaching. Um, the second deep teaching, at least for myself, is not indulging negative rumination. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, basically, if we keep looping around the track in which we're glued to the screen of our negative thoughts, feelings, desires, history, and so forth, or we keep looping through our resentments about other people, our case against them, you know, why they're bad, why they're wrong, why we're right, and all the rest of that. If we do that because neurons that fire together wire together, when we keep looping around those tracks, we're digging those tracks a little deeper every time I go, we go around them. So the second thing that I've seen and research really supports it is to pull out of negative rumination. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean to fight it, because if you fight it, then you're glued to it. Mm -hmm. It's to step back from it and to stop fueling it. That's one thing I've really seen. And then I think the last thing I've seen a lot is to recognize the limits of your influence. And here, too, it's counterintuitive, counterintuitive to really claim the agency, the sense of being a cause in your life rather than an effect, a cue ball rather than an eight ball. To actually claim that, it's necessary to see the vast ways you don't have any power. Mm -hmm. You're basically unable to make things better. You can't make them love you. You can't make them think certain things. You can't make them want certain things. Generally, you can't even make them act in certain ways. But what you can do is tend to the causes over here of what is under your influence, which first and foremost are the thoughts, the feelings, the desires, the perspectives, the practices that are running through your own mind. So for me, it's actually brought me to a kind of sense of both potency in terms of claiming where I do have agency and making sure I really am tending to the causes I can tend to, while also alongside that potency is a great sense of peace about what I cannot change for the better. The last thing I want to say about the Foundations of Wellbeing program is that it's about practice. Mm -hmm. It's easy to read an inspirational quote on your Facebook feed. 
it's easy to have a little thought flow through your mind. Oh, I shouldn't sweat the small stuff or whatever it is. And these are beautiful inspirational phrases. These are wonderful thoughts. But do they actually make that much difference for a person? Mm -hmm. Usually not. What really makes a difference for people over time, I've seen it in myself, and that's what the research supports as well, is to do practices, is to practice. Take a moment for gratitude. Um, take a moment to really let it land that your dog loves you. Uh, spend five or ten minutes a day doing some form of meditation or prayer or whatever it is that actually helps you feel better and more stable inside yourself. Um, take on a practice of trying to understand the people around you better without immediately jumping to your own conclusions or interpretations about what they're saying or doing. In other words, make small efforts. A few minutes here, a few seconds there, but accumulate it over the course of your day. And these wise efforts that you're making inside your mind your own practices will really make a big difference for you over time. I believe in the plugger theory of life. You know, that if you just keep banging on it, if you keep plugging away at some form of skillful action, if only inside your own mind, if you can't do anything out there in the world, mm -hmm. if you keep plugging away, you keep churning and making efforts, first you'll feel in your heart that you've done everything you can do. And you'll have a certain sense of dignity, self-respect, self-worth, and peace of mind for that reason alone. Second, plugging away, doing practices, it's your best odd strategy mm -hmm. for improving your own global state of being, which is the origin point for all the actions that fan out from you. And it's your best odd strategy for making yourself even more appealing or respectable for other people or likable for other people so that they'll want to join with you and support you. So if all else fails, remember that one word, practice. Mm -hmm.